Often when I'm painting the landscape, I end up with a reference photo that only shows me a part of my tree. And this is a winter landscape uh, of aspens. And it's just a very simple exercise. I was working on painting trees and I find the, the completed painting a little bit boring. I probably wouldn't frame this or anything, but it was a good exercise in just getting a really frosty look and getting a wintry tree look. And it also was a really good way of showing you how, how to paint a, an aspen tree trunk and branches in the winter. So we're gonna just go walk through that step by step here. First thing you'll want to do is choose the right colors for your for your trees. And I'm going to be using ultramarine blue and burnt umber. And the thing about those two colors is when you blend them together, you get a gray. And a little more blue, and of course it's a blue-gray, a little more brown. And it's a little more gray yet. Of course, too much brown. And it's a very grayish blue-brown. So you get a really neat range of colors when you're mixing your, your blue ultramarine or cobalt blue and a burnt umber, burnt sienna, one of those kind of reddish browns. And when you mix those two together, you get a beautiful neutral. So I love using those for painting winter scenes, for painting snow, shadows, anytime I need a neutral gray. So that's what I'm going to be using for my tree trunks. And I'm just going to start, make sure I have my mix the way I want it. I want it a little bit more on the blue side, I think. And then, you know, when you're painting, I'm going to go this way actually. When you're painting trees, so often if they're nice and close to you, you're not going to see the tops. You might not even see the, the bottom where it's anchored into the landscape. You might just have a trunk going the full length of your picture plane. And then you maybe have your horizon, you know, along in here and, you know, more trees here. And of course, trees in the background of your landscape are just, oh, look at me, I'm getting distracted. Trees in the background of your landscape are just, you know, um, a single unit shape. And uh, of course I just painted them green and I was talking about painting winter trees, but we'll say it's early spring. Anyhow, and then you'd have your landscape here, your horizon, and then maybe a tree in the front of the picture plane. And yeah, look at me getting all distracted. Of course, when you're painting a landscape, you want to be aware of where you're placing your, your close-up focal point elements, even if you end up painting your background first, you need to have an idea of where they're going to be positioned on the page. So let's just quickly... Now I moistened this area as well, so we have the colors bleeding. We've got our darkest shadow on this right-hand side. With a little bit of straight ultramarine blue I can go in. Add a little more shadow, and look at how that's bleeding and blending on the page really nicely. Something else, uh, I can give it a chance to dry a little bit, and as it dries then I can start making decisions about how I'm going to paint my the little scars and bumps on the tree. That really gives it a great finished look. Just mixing up some more of my gray. Ultramarine blue, and I think this is burnt sienna actually. And of course the more paint to water ratio, the darker it's gonna be. So I mixed quite a dark mixture and it's a little heavier on the burnt sienna. Our aspen trees that grow around here so often don't even have leaves until you reach the way up towards the top. And I can put another one here. And they just have broken stubby branches here and there. And you can see because it's wet, as soon as I touch it with color it wants to bleed, which really gives us kind of a nice scarry look. 
If you find your tree is getting darker than you want it this early stage, you can just dry your brush a little bit and lift out some of that color with your damp brush or with your paper towel, a rag of some kind. And uh, yeah, I'm liking the look of that. I'm going to add a little more blue to my gray mixture. I'm always varying my mixtures of colors as I'm painting. It really makes for a more interesting painting, even if you're just varying it by fractions. Some dark stuff down here. And now would be a good time to allow things to dry, and then I can go back in a minute or two and paint some more details. Paint those scars that we were talking about. Very few branches. We're, I'm basically demonstrating trunks here anyhow, so give you an idea of how I paint my aspen trunks. Okay, let's let that dry and we'll come back to it in a couple minutes. Okay, so my winter trees had a chance to dry and I'm going to paint some details on it. And ordinarily I would use Payne's Grey, which is what I've used in this. Payne's Grey is a dark, dark, dark blue and uh, got some black in it which is why it's so dark. I don't have Payne's Grey in the palette I'm using today and uh, you know it's not good to rely on anyone to color too much anyhow so it's, sometimes it's good to just pull out and work with an unfamiliar palette and a few colors that you don't that you're used to using that you don't have all of a sudden gives you a chance to really try some new things try some different color mixes maybe you'll learn something and get a little better. If you ever feel like you're getting stuck in a rut with your watercolor, or with any kind of painting, try some new colors. Try some new color mixes. And I've found that for me it really can be inspiring. It can really enliven my painting. So I just put in a few little dark blotches, scars, and then some of them I blend out a little bit to lighten and spread and you can see already the character that's adding to my tree not overdoing it I hope depending on the age of the tree and the type of tree you're gonna have maybe more texture than other others in our northern region, there are actually not, a, not as many tree varieties that really survive well over the winter, at least not in the wild. And so I've really built my landscapes around the aspen and the evergreen trees that grow in the north here. I'm using some of that same gray that I mixed, only just a light tone of it. And all these little ed lines that I'm making that have nice crisp edges really add texture to my tree. And you can see how much texture I have now. And then I can go on if I want to paint more branches. Now is a good time to do that. Maybe I want this to be a full sized branch. Anytime you're painting branches, pull out. Don't ever go from the tip of the branch in because as you're painting, it's much easier to make a thinner line as you pull out and start with a thick line and then your line gets thinner as you lift your brush off the page. It's a lot harder to start with a thin line than to end with one. And I quite like that actually. This branch is coming from behind the tree. There we go. And maybe another one here. That one came out a little thicker than I wanted, so I decided to make it more of a supporting branch coming out from behind the tree as well. 
and yeah, not too bad. So that's just a very quick sketch. Now if I were doing more trees, like in this forest scene that I showed you earlier, you can see how, and I never finished this, um, I would probably add a little more detail to this tree. It's closer than these trees, and I've placed them on different planes of my picture, as well as varying the value. This tree is a little more detailed and a little darker. These trees are lighter and have less detail because they are further away. And uh, of course that's key in, in creating a landscape is giving that sense of distance, making sure you do decrease in detail as you, as you pull back to, to things further away. Okay, let's paint autumn trees. Again, with my aspens, aspens in autumn, and we're going to start with the leaves. Aspens are very yellow in the autumn. I'm going to take some artistic license and add some oranges as well. I'm just going to start by painting my tree shape. And in this case, we're going to do a mass of several. So again, I'm looking at several trees and I'm painting them as a group. I've got quinacridone gold, which is kind of an orangey gold, and Indian yellow, which is vibrant and very true to the brilliant yellows we get with our aspens. I really like this idea of just kind of trailing off in a lighter color. Generally the tips of trees, branches, there's just a few leaves and so it's going to be lighter to anyhow. And now I'm going to pull out some orange. Just touch in a little bit here and there. That's a very orangey orange. I think it's perylene orange or something like that. Some more quinacridone gold. And this tree hasn't completely converted, so let's put some greens in there. Just going to grab some sap green. And for some reason it's looking very brown, so I might need to clean my brush here. I think it's looking so brown because I grabbed my green gold, and this particular brand of green gold is quite brownish. little bits of green and if you touch pure color into quite a wet wash it's going to want to bleed and give you some great mixes. Now a tree on a sunny day especially is going to have some shadow so let's paint in some of those shadows. Now what do you think we should use to paint a shadow on a tree? In a yellow tree. I'll tell you what I like to use and that is purple. So I just grabbed a little bit of dioxazine violet and what the purple does when it hits the yellow is it mixes and creates a neutral which gives us a gray and if it doesn't mix, then it's quite purple looking, and if it does, you get more of a gray tone. And I've just got a ton of beautiful colors in my tree here, which I'm really enjoying. The top of my tree here is looking a little neglected. Let's add some more color to that part. And maybe some green. Oh, well, that's nice. And just to be really bold and really draw the eye, I'm going to grab some of this um, perylene red, I believe. And just in a few areas, I'm going to add that brilliant crimson. Just because I want a tree that no one will forget. If 
you're going to use this many colors in the tree, you want it to be your focal point. Now we're going to need a trunk, so let's grab some colors for our tree trunks. And I'm going to make a neutral, but I'm not going to use the cobalt blue and burnt sienna that I often use. Instead I'm going to grab my quinacridone gold and my di dioxazine violet. Those two colors are complementary, so when you mix them, I'll just show you on a separate sheet of paper, you get a neutral. Look at that, it's, oh, it's beautiful. And you can vary the quantities of, and proportions of violet to gold to get different tones. It's a little more purple in that one. This is a little bit more gold, and then it's almost a rich brown, so you can see the variety of neutrals you get there. Mixing complementary colors is a fantastic way to get fascinating neutrals, and much more fun than just pulling out a gray or a brown out of a tube. Okay, so let's paint a trunk, and this tree is going to have my trunk coming down from here. And that's pretty brown still. So I'm going to grab a little more of that violet. And in fact, if I use straight violet on this side, that really gives me a great looking shadow. And then I can start painting some branches. And again, I'm pulling out from the trunk because generally when you first touch your brush to paper, your color is, or your line is going to be thicker. And then you can lift it as you go and get a thinner line. It's very hard to go the other way. Because my tree is still damp, I get color bleeding in whenever I touch my branches to my trees, and I'm okay with that. I kind of like it. And this tree, uh, it could be a single tree that really is spreading out sideways. Not so true to our aspens around here, but I like the I like the look of it anyhow. And. Uh, like I said before, if you're painting, I like my trunk to blend into the landscape, so I usually pull the color right down onto my picture plane here. And then I can go in, uh, and I have a place to work from, so my tree looks anchored into the environment. Not so much on this side, right? You take some of those colors. And, and again, I'm pulling up because my brush strokes are going to get lighter as they are thinner as they come up. And it's just very creative. And wherever I want that, if I drop that purple in. There, I don't know, it just looks good. Maybe I want more trees in the background so I can grab some of that violet and gold mixture again. I'm going to go a little stronger on the violet to make it cooler. Generally, objects become cooler as they recede into the distance, and that is. There's different color theory reasons for that, which uh, you can learn if you turn into a color theory nerd like me. And maybe another one back here. 
Maybe I want to add a little bit of blue to my purple as well. I'm having trouble getting just the right mix that I want. And that sometimes happens. That's a little darker than I wanted, so I'm just going to use my brush to sponge up some of that color. trunk back here. Again, I'm forgetting about my picture plane, which would give me, would mean my trunk would stop a little further. If this tree is further away than this one, then it needs to end up, the, the base of it needs to be further up on the page as well. It's so easy to get caught up in painting an object and making it look realistic and then realizing you forgot about proportion or forgot to give it that, just forgot some crucial detail that made it a lot less believable in your painting. And having those varying planes on your page is a big part of that. Okay, so this has had a chance to dry a little bit. It's still quite damp. I just felt it with the back of my finger. It still feels cool. So I know it's damp. I'm going to give it a chance to dry and then I'm going to go back in and just add a, a little bit of detail, a few crisp edges to really give it a finished look. But already I'm really liking the look of my autumn tree. It's very painterly and colorful and as, I don't know, it just has some really neat mixes of color that are happening. I'll just zoom in a little bit so you can see them really like this area right here, that interesting blend of color. And then over here as well, you can see some edges and a little hint of branch and a little hint of maybe a, a gust of wind or a breeze making those leaves wiggle. So we're just coming back to my dried autumn trees and my leaves are fully dry, my trunks are dry, I'm ready to go in and add some final details to this painting. And I'm going to start by just adding some some interesting crisp lines to my trees. I'm starting with the trees because I find that if you work from top to bottom you're not going to be resting your hand in wet paint, which is always a good thing. You don't want to smudge your areas that you've worked so hard to to make lovely. I kind of had a muddyish yellow mix in my palette already, so I'm using that to to go in. And what I really want to do is just put some depth in my trees. I'm not really crazy about that muddy yellow color actually. Let's grab something a little more vibrant. Because everything, when you're painting wet and wet, everything blends together, you don't get a lot of crisp lines. So it's a good idea if you want to add some more, if you want to draw the eye and add some more detail, to go in and add some, some lines, some areas that have those crisp edges. It's a way of adding texture to your painting. And... I also find that near the center of the tree it's going to be darker, there's going to be more shadow. So you can keep that in mind as you, as you paint. And that just gives it a little more depth. You can also go in at this time. Of course, I don't have any of my original trunk color left, so I'm going to mix a little more of it. Keeping in mind it was the quinacridone gold and the dioxazine purple. And then I can go in and maybe add some branches here and there.
And the other thing I could do is go back in and add some texture to my trees. Oops, that's a smudge. It's up to you how much texture you want to add. Um, you can use a dry brush technique to just use the roughness of the paper. Just let your brush kind of skip across. Dry brush being that your brush is basically dry. Oops. And has very little paint on it. And then as you pull it across your paper, it just skips along and, and leaves a bit of a mark. And I'm going to call that done.